Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us today um, uh, for this webinar with the title Foster FinTech in Malta. On behalf of the members participating at this, at this event, as well as Finance Malta members in general, I would like to start by thanking you for being here, thanking as well Finance Malta for giving us this opportunity to submit our proposals and for this webinars, for webinars such as these. These webinars have the objective of highlighting the advantages, whilst addressing as well disadvantages and certain challenges experienced in the financial services sector, including fintech. In Malta, in Europe, and globally as well, since we play part of the larger international scene. In this regard, Finance Malta has supported us members by providing the webinar platform, promoting the event, and assisting us as well in the preparation and structure of this event. Um, to this end, special thanks also goes to RiskDeck. RiskDeck is a Finance Malta member, and they conceived the idea behind this webinar. So they were the inceptors behind it. Um, uh, I'm informed as well that Finance Malta had to do a fintech, a fintech uh, seminar. It had to be postponed due to COVID. Um, however, this seminar is going to be organized later on this year. So stay tuned for further developments on, uh, on this trend, on this end. Uh, specifically on this, we also do encourage um, all Finance Malta members who are interested in participating and putting forward these initiatives to check the guidelines on the Finance Malta website or contact Finance Malta uh, staff directly and uh, query about these um, uh, pitch desks and webinars. Now, during today's brief webinar, we will be focusing specifically on FinTech. FinTech as a technological enabler, as well as FinTech within the financial services realm, so with the new financial services players. And assessing how this can be um, further enhanced and fostered um, in countries like Malta. Now, to do this, I'm lucky um, to be moderating a fantastic panel of experts. My name is Ian Gauci. I'm the managing partner of GTG. I'm a lawyer and regulatory consultant working exclusively in fintech related matters and technology. And accompanying me today, I have uh, members from the MFSA. I have members from this deck, I have members from the VIR group, and I have members as well um, um, from Fiorin. And I will leave the floor uh, for a brief intro round robin um, to the respective members, starting with this deck, Lucas. Hello, everyone. So, uh... Lucas, uh, part of uh, head of development of, uh, of RISTEC. Uh, so quick in introduction about what we do. Uh, we basically create a um, dedicated solution to institutional investors so that they can really centralize all their operations on one single platform. Um, and should it be uh, onboarding investors or monitoring your portfolio management and doing risk management, um, the goal is to really centralize everything on one go. Uh, so that's in a nutshell. Uh, we've been uh, a fintech based in Malta since uh, 2019 um, and uh, are also active uh, as much as the local in this uh, local jurisdictions are already a bit uh, already in Europe. Herman? Hi, hi. Thank you, Ian. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Herman Chapar. I'm the head of fintech supervision within the Malta. Financial Services Authority. We are the single regulator of financial services in Malta. As head of fintech supervision, I, I drive all the fintech initiatives within the MFSA, but I am also responsible for, for anything to do with virtual financial assets. So, so essentially, I'm also responsible for, for the crypto sector in Malta. We authorize and supervise uh, financial services, uh, virtual financial assets, um, service providers, and, and we register white papers. Thank you. Maybe Dimitri. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, I wish it could be an in-person conference, but anyway, it's, uh, it's still good to, to meet like this and uh, share our uh, views. Uh, my name is Dimitris Litsikagis. I'm CEO of uh, the VR in Money. Uh, the VR is one of the largest financial uh, advisory firms in the world. We are headquartered in Dubai. Um, we mainly uh, cater to high net worth individuals, uh, having more than a $10 billion uh, portfolio uh, under management. 
And uh, previous to that, I was a um, country manager for Revolut in Greece, Cyprus, and uh, Malta. So I'm happy to, to join you guys and uh, discuss today with uh, everyone. And last but not least, James Floyd. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'm James, I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Fiorin. Fiorin is a technology platform where through a curated network of uh, global financial institutions, we uh, offer tailored business banking to, to, to businesses. Uh, through our uh, network of financial institutions, uh, businesses will be served with uh, multi-currency dedicated IBANs, sub-accounts, uh, virtual accounts, and also um, um, virtual cards. We are a fintech startup. Uh, we actually uh, co-founders, three Maltese, and we are also headquartered here in, in Malta. Very good, very good. So let's put on to some questions. And I will start with Hermin. Um, Hermin MFSA. Uh, Hermin, recently, the, recently, in the past years, the MFSA has been quite active on the fintech sphere, in the fintech sphere. They launched the fintech strategy, retail payment strategy. We have been um, one of the first countries as well as an inceptor to regulate VFA, cryptocurrencies, as you mentioned before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How would you describe these past years um, of the MFSA and what's, uh, what's coming up? Thanks, thanks Ian for that. And, and I would also like to thank Finance Malta for, for organizing this uh, webinar and for, for inviting me to, to be here. Uh, I agree with you, Ian. Uh, for sure, I, I strongly believe that uh, the MFSA has been very proactive in, in the fintech space. As you rightly mentioned, uh, as early as 2019, two years ago, essentially, we had launched the, the fintech strategy, which essentially lays down the, the, the plans, the objectives, the foundations of what the MFSA wanted to do in the space to promote and support and, and enable startups, uh, financial service providers, and also technology providers to come up with their solutions and, and uh, drive, drive innovation through the, the product and, and service offering. So, so this was, a, I think, a, a very comprehensive document. I think it was super ambitious at the time. And, and essentially what we've been trying to do over the last uh, two years or so is, is work. We, we have identified our priorities within the strategy and we have been working towards implementing some of these, these initiatives. Uh, in particular, um, I, I like to mention the, the, the implementation of the FinTech regulatory sandbox, which we launched in, in 2020. We believe the sandbox is, is a primary tool that, that will help uh, fintech startups and, and financial services uh, incumbents who, who want to, to integrate uh, fintech in, in their products and services, because the, the sandbox offers them a, a safe and controlled environment where, whereby they can test and bring to market their, their solutions. And it offers us regulators also a platform for us to understand better and, and understand the risks of the technology and uh, I'd understand any blind spots that we might have so that we can uh, obviously try to, to mitigate any, any of these risks, obviously to, to protect uh, the investor and, and market uh, integrity. So this is one of the, our main initiatives that, that we've been working on. Uh, a second initiative we've been um, spending a lot of time on is, is uh, establishing international links. And in, in this pillar, we've been very active uh, in, in, in FIF. FIF is the European Forum for Innovation Facilitators. It's, a, it's an ESA's um, network. Um, and, and GFIN. GFIN is the Global Financial Innovation Network. Both are, are platforms where supervisors meet. And these are quite, quite uh, the best supervisors in the world, essentially. We meet and the, the general objective of these for us to, to foster cooperation, we share experiences, we share technological expertise, and uh, most, most important of all, we, we try to understand and, and see how we can deal, have regulatory treatment of uh, these innovative project, products. Uh, of course, our, our raison d'etre, our being is, um, we need to regulate the, the space, um, as much as we want things to innovate and, and to, to, to bring new ideas to the market, uh, for sure, we remain, um, our main focus is, okay, how do we deal with it? How do we make it safe for, for investors? So we've been, we've been very much engaged in, in, in these international fora. 
uh, very interesting that that now we're, we're talking also of cross-border sandbox testing. We realize that sandboxing in within one jurisdiction is great, but but since everyone seems to be doing the same thing, uh, the, the new concept is coming up of what if we start doing uh, cross-border sandbox? So from one sandbox, you can go to another, uh, have access to multiple markets. So this is, we're trying right now to lay the foundations in, in this space. And, and we're, 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 of course, a very small jurisdiction, but we're very proud to be the right, be right up there, joining, joining the, the bigger ones, like, like the FCA and, and, and the, the, the French and, and the US guys. Um, so that we can we can contribute and we do have ways to contribute with our experience in the in this space and and also learn learn from such an experience um you also uh, referred to and and what what else is happening for sure i cannot not mention what what is happening in europe obviously the, the world has been going pretty fast over the last years uh, as you all know uh, the commission came up very strongly in, in September Can I stop you on this? And maybe I ask a direct question related. I think you are going to uh, anticipate me, quite honestly. Okay. Fast. Well, you're speaking about uh, it, it's well and good international collaboration. The fact that, yes, Malta is part of an international dimension, we're part of the European Union. Okay. Uh, we've been the inceptors, we've, we've covered the legislation, which to a certain extent is quite unique. The European Union, the directors, the regulation did not cater for it. And this is precisely what is being discussed right now. I think you are going to the, refer to the EU financial package, Mika, yes. DORA, and uh, the DLT uh, pilot project. Uh, in the DLT, we were, I think, one of the inceptors as well, respective of uh, FinTech dedicated as well as specific technology dealing with the LT and smart uh, authority dealing with the LT and smart context. Um, however, specifically with Mika and Dora, which will cut across particularly Dora, uh, all the financial services. A sectorial, the, yes, yes for sure. But Mika is specifically uh, on VFA. So VFA's cryptos will now form part of the financial services package. How far advanced are we as a country, given our regime? Do we need to? change a little bit, are, are, there, are there any, any benefits in us having such a, an innovative and forward-looking piece of legislation? What are your comments on that? Thank you, thank you for that. I, I, I was not going to delve too much on, on VFA, but, but once you, you're asking me, uh, it would be my pleasure. Uh, for sure, I, I think th this is great. Uh, we, we, we really, we're quite happy that, that the European Commission and Europe per se will be adopting a regulatory framework for, for crypto asset service providers. As you rightly mentioned, and as everyone knows, uh, Malta has been a pioneer in the space. We, we, we came up with our VFA framework as early as 1st November 2018. And we were very happy to, to note that uh, essentially both our framework and Mika, Mika are based on, on the same uh, traditional uh, regulatory space, MIFID essentially being treated, these assets being treated as, as investment uh, instruments. Uh, so yes, we, we our VFA framework is, is super close to, to Mika. If anything, it, it's, 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 it's heavier than Mika. So when you ask me, where are we vis-a-vis -vis, uh, aligning to, to Mika, I think we, it would be very easy to, to align our, our framework, uh, get it more, more close to Mika, by actually trimming it out, <laughs> we actually have to almost lower our 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 standards, our prerequisites to to make it make it compliant. So this is this is great because as as you may know, we already have several uh, service providers uh, licensed by us. We have fourteen VASPs at, at the moment, and and the 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 number is is growing. So, so yes, for them, we we are already have started working. Although the text of Mika has not been essentially settled yet, but we have already started with our gap analysis and, and having a plan of how we move forward when, when Mika comes into force and when Mika becomes applicable. So we have a plan. Uh, for sure, we want to make this transition as, as effortless as possible for our license holders. Uh, and, and for sure, uh, and within the, the space of our discussion today, I think we, we, are, we are very well placed to be in, in pole position. Uh, unlike other uh, jurisdictions, we have expertise in house. We've been working with with the, this space for for over two years. We have authorized. We are supervising. We have the right tools. We have the right skills. 
So essentially, I think it would be very clever for us to, to position ourselves well, uh, because essentially, come, come Mika, um, all VASPs operating in Europe have to be licensed. Uh, there's there's no other way about it. Right now, there's a choice. Like right now, it's, it's a simple registration under AMLD5, which which essentially means means nothing. But going forward, all these guys have to be licensed in, in a big way. And what we'll be saying is that listen, um, we've been doing this for two years already. When Mika becomes applicable, would have been doing this for four years. So I think would be very well placed as jurisdiction to 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 open for business for for this uh, influx. Thanks, 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 thank you. Um, uh, having covered the service angle uh, now, I would like to, uh, in the regulatory dimension, I would like to um, touch a little bit on the uh, technological enabler. So FinTech as a technological enabler. Um, um, and I was going to ask uh, Lucas specifically here. Lucas, what are your views here? How do you understand? How do we understand? How does the Indian industry understand um, fintech as a technology enabler? And what is your experience um, to this extent in Malta? Um, well, definitely uh, quite a lot of things that could be said there. Um, the first thing is that, of course, technology by itself is a great mean in order to um, do a lot of things such as you know saving time and energy on some redundant tasks and very simple things um, and to increase uh, you know processes and things like that um, the particularity with the finance industry so being a fintech in the finance industry is that you also need to comply uh, to some regulations um, and this is why um, tech is even more important in the way it really needs to be properly established um, and needs to be um, you know, something adopted within most of the, if not all the industry players uh, in, in the finance industry. Um, so whether it is, for example, banks communicating to each other or um, some things, other things like that, it's, it's pretty essential. Um, and so that's why for us, it was quite necessary uh, to be uh, really in line and in contact with other industrial players uh, while we started RISTEC, uh, because even though actually we're by basis a tech company, uh, we had to discuss with local players who are really more on the, on the finance side in order for us to understand how to shape the software uh, so that it is in compliance with uh, regulations. Um, and this is why it's also important then to be really in close relationship with, you know, um, typically, of course, the regulator, such as the MFSA. So uh, having the chance ourselves to be uh, within this, this digital uh, sandbox program where here uh, we'll be able to really be in close relationship and really get to um, be in line with when some new regulations come over, we'll be ready to adapt the software in that sense in order to um, comply. And of course, to get our clients comply uh, with the regulations because, okay. yeah. Um, I, I, I'm sorry if I stop you here, but you're speaking about the sandbox and this is something which is quite interesting for me. Uh, you are a technology service provider you don't have a financial services license, so unless you're one of the lucky ones who might have a financial services company using your services, to a certain extent, the sandbox of the um, MFSA is a little bit difficult to harness up on. How would you see Malta um, positioned to the extent that, aside from having a NADOC FinTech financial services sandbox, which is also an incubator, and it has international dimension as well, because as Herman mentioned before, it's part of an international group now, even for interoperability. What is one of the only countries as yet who has a specific technology sandbox, specific on technology, the MDIA one? Have you ever heard of it? Do you think that such a sandbox could be useful for technology outfits like yourself who don't have a license and who might not have any um, uh, Financial services uh, license holder as a client as yet. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it's it's a it's a question of also like what is the needs uh, within the jurisdictions and also the needs of us as the company as a, as a tech company. Um, for sure, uh, the the thing you know doing this relation with the MFSA helps us in uh, you know being very close to the financial side parts, um, as in for other initiatives. Uh, other programs, then 
as long as it helps in fostering, you know, tech and helping us in the development of a software um, in order to, to shape the product uh, in order so that it really goes well within the market, then that's, that's definitely something to go for. Yeah. What about and resources? If, if I may, Ian, yes. Yes, Kermit, uh, yes, you always may. Just, just to, to give in my, my, my bit in here. To be fair, um, what we have tried to do with, with our proposal for the FinTech uh, sandboxes is also to, to have space to include software solution providers. So essentially guys like, like RiskDeck can also apply. They don't have to have a, a licensable activity, but being a service provider um, or a platform provider, which uh, whose platform will be used by financial service uh, license holders. We also allow such, such incumbents to, to fit within our our sandbox. Of course, they're, they're more, more difficult to control because essentially we don't have any mandate on them, but, but we're trying to, to come up with, with, with legal agreements uh, so that we could uh, base this relationship uh, with, with such product developers. But we do, we do believe that this is an important space to give uh, guys like, like RiskTech in, in this case, so that uh, such product providers could engage uh, license holders like banks or, or insurance or, 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 or whoever, or investment services. And, and together, the license holders and the, 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 the software solution work together within the sandbox to actually test, test, test the platform and, and, and speak to the regulator. Uh, and, and we really see it in such, such software in action. So we, we do allow this, this thing. Um, and and I hope we could also attract uh, incumbents like like Chris Deck to 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 our offering. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if I can, if I can just if I can just jump on on what Herman said, it's true that the fact that ourselves we're not a regulated entity, it really helps us in being flexible, in the sense that we can quickly adapt if needed. We can actually quickly uh, scale in the market. Uh, because there's uh, we can something we can deploy some things a bit more rapidly, um, and so that really kind of helps in um, being a tech company itself, and actually why not attracting other fintech companies which are in the same situation as us in in, in the Maltese yes. jurisdiction. Yeah. Definitely uh, from the technology side, and I think Malta there is if you allow me very well positioned. If you look at what's happening under the AI, AI Act, um, cybersecurity certification, touching on cloud on SOG right now, so even IoT, all things which are quite relevant within the financial services real, even this too. Um, so to a certain extent, um, there having the MFSA yes, with, the, with the sandbox, uh, another authority which, with another sandbox which can touch across as well data protection, which is quite relevant for a software provider like yourselves. I think they were quite positioned, very well positioned. And even with the experience of the MFSA having started the fintech set sandbox now for over a year, Hermit. 2020, yes. So for over a year. Um, that's definitely value added for what's coming up. However, now let me pass on because we are quite limited by time. Um, um, to James. Um, I wanted to ask a specific question to James, given that he's um, he's quite active in the market. Uh, how do you see resources in Malta, resources and funding? So how do you perceive the island? Um, can you give us your views? Yeah, I think from, a, from an resources perspective, um, definitely there is uh, a lot of, of, of technical uh, talent uh, locally. Um, by no means means that you know this is it's, it's easy to attract talent uh, locally. I think this is a, a problem that not only Malta is facing, but it's a problem that we are facing uh, at a global stage. But I think there is uh, there is there is talent uh, and there is also potential. So I think on the on that regard, even as, as we were mentioning before, when it comes to to tech, Malta is very well positioned, and even from a resources perspective, um, when it comes to funding. Um, one have to say that you know Malta. The reality is that when you look, when you compare Malta and fintech uh, to to countries like you know UK and even France, for example, and other big other uh, European countries, we we are behind when it comes to funding, right? So we don't have the structure in place, like you know we don't have venture capitalists, we don't have super angel investors in place, and this could be for a number of reasons, right? I mean, 
One of the things is that Malta we never had uh, a fintech company that was actually born from Malta and actually went into a unicorn status, right? And that will actually have a ripple effect. But I think that having said this, I think that Malta is, is, is really good then, especially when it comes to the fintech, because in fintech, what you want to do is that you want to build fast, you actually want to gain traction very fast. And I think given the, the position of Malta, given the, the also the size of Malta, and also now we're talking about these sandboxes, uh, cross borders and boxes, this will actually help companies, specifically technology companies and the fintech side to actually build fast, validate more their, their, their proposition, right? Uh, to the market and even potentially launch, right? Uh, launch, for example, something in Malta, get feedback, uh, because in reality, when you launch a product in the fintech side, you want actually to actually launch a product, validate that product, make sure that it actually is working before you actually start scaling up. And that would potentially then start attracting you know, investors. Because essentially when you go and to investors and say, okay, I have a product that actually already gaining traction, then you know, investors can actually start looking at Malta into a different, different aspect. Maybe they're looking at Malta to actually tap in into companies at, at an early stage, right? Because of the geographical position of again, they can actually uh, test the product. Um, so to answer your question, I think, I think there is a lot of things happening when it comes to, to, to the funding and, and I think things have been really improving. Um, of course, there is still a lot of things that needs to be improved, but I think we're, we're, on, the, we're on the right track. So if I understood you correctly, you're saying that on one side, we're small. So given that we're small, from the attractiveness point of view, even venture capital is the size of the market and the scalability, it could be a limitation. But on the other hand, given that we have a micro um, uh, dimension to roll out technology, the ease, okay, to uh, go to market and to test, particularly when we have two set boxes, one technology and one specifically dedicated to fintech. fintech. Our size, uh, if I understood you correctly, in that uh, from that side of the coin is a plus point. So that would be it's a definitely. An enabler for Moldau, correct? It's definitely, it's definitely a, a plus point, but it's also the most important thing is that you will not only remain in Malta, but you also then scale up. And I think also the position of Malta, we're, we're, we're actually you know, uh, two hours away uh, to, to mainland Europe, right? We are also very close to uh, North Africa, where, for example, FinTech is something that is actually growing and growing. So it is a, also, it acts like a, a good stepping stone to actually expand your product and take it to the, to the next level. So definitely it, it has its, its, own, its own benefits from that front. Very good, thanks James, thanks for these comments. Now, um, I will pass on to Dimitri. Dimitri, uh, you're a guy who, who has a filter of experience, um, uh, having been with one of the unicorns, the successes in Europe started as a software company, from a software company now they had that they have as well their uh, financial services license licenses before so you're quite experienced uh, if i had to ask you what in your views are the plus points uh, what are the strengths of a small country like malta within this sphere what would you um uh, how would you answer me so Ian, thank you for your question. Uh, I think I'll have to uh, agree with James on this. I think the um, the size of of, uh, of a country like Molda is ideal when you want to to launch uh, things and uh, try new products, uh, launch them fast. Uh, my experience working in Molda showed me how uh, how things can um, uh, scale super fast. Uh, the, the world can go out. Uh, immediately and because of proximity basically people start to talk about it and if you manage to build a, an amazing product and uh, people love it they will start talking about it and it will be uh, you know it, it goes viral very fast and um, maybe if I can also offer uh, an example from uh, my home country in Greece which is still considered a small market right it's 10 million uh, people if you talk to any US investor, they will probably laugh. It's uh, smaller than California, for example, and it's just one state. So um, uh, recently, the, the last two weeks, we, we have seen uh, the largest acquisition uh, in fintech. 
uh, but overall in, in the startup field. And it was JP and Morgan, the largest bank uh, in the world, investing uh, on uh, Viva, Viva Wallet. So uh, the valuation of the company uh, was $2 billion. And uh, now we have our first unicorn in the country. Why, the, uh, why do I say this? Because uh, Viva exactly started as a, as a technology provider. They evolved the product uh, here domestically in Greece, and then they started uh, exploring other markets. They didn't do it in one big blow, but uh, uh, steadily, and they were expanding into key markets. So I think it's um, the best way to, to approach this is not having um, a local mindset, but European from the start, okay? Or even global, if you, if you can uh, think bigger, uh, or if you are a technology provider that uh, is inter industry agnostic or uh, jurisdiction agnostic. Um, so the end game and the vision of the founder should be big enough in order to, uh, to, 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 to attract this kind of investment. Uh, but also talent, because uh, as James said, it's, it's very difficult these days uh, to attract top talent in, in terms of software development. Uh, you'll be very lucky to find somebody who, uh, you know, is capable of scaling uh, products really fast. Um, specifically on talent. Having the talent, let's concentrate a little, a little bit on attracting talent. We've done this even in other industries, attracting talent so that you can build the right ecosystem here in Malta. Now, I, I will ask you a candid question. Um, it's easy to speak about attracting. It's easy to speak about schemes to bring people over. However, from experience, you've been here, you've worked here, okay? Uh, if I had to tell you, okay, in order to attract talent, you need to have uh, people coming here from abroad, they will need to find good international schools. The visa process will need to be streamlined, will need to be uh, fast, okay? Uh, what else? It would be easy as well to apply for VET numbers if you're a company or a, an associated company or a company within the ceremony and assisting the investor. How do you see the multi scene um, with this regard? Uh, I know it's not easy, but You've been here and we hear people um, commenting on this and highlighting certain aspects where we can improve. So mm -hmm. what are your views about it, Dimitri? So it is a difficult uh, question and uh, everyone is facing the same issue. However, after COVID, I think uh, remote work has grown exponentially and it has become the new norm. Uh, most of us right now are, uh, are located at home, right? And we are all collaborating and uh, talking to each other. Most of the attendees uh, over here, I, I would assume that they have logged on from home. So it really doesn't matter where you are uh, physically. Um, if, if you are an amazing uh, you know, talent in whatever you do, uh, be it a marketeer or uh, you know, um, a developer or whatever, it doesn't matter where you are these days. Uh, my team, for example, it's scattered around the world. I have resources in uh, Lithuania where we have our e-money license. Uh, I have um, uh, people in uh, customer service in Greece. I have uh, people in uh, um, marketing in Dubai and in Malta uh, and other partners in, uh, in the UK and across Europe. So. Uh, I don't think that, you know, we should be worried about bringing people actually in the country. Um, if the product, once again, the product is amazing and you have a story that is uh, very attractive uh, and the founders are very well positioned to communicate this, uh, this vision, I think talent will follow. Um, schemes and, uh, you know, all these uh, government initiated uh, 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 let's say initiatives. Uh, I have experience in, in Greece as well. We keep talking about it. Uh, come to Greece, you can work from here, you can go to an island and uh, work from anywhere, basically. Okay, they sound nice, but uh, at the end of the day, um, we are not selling the beats or, uh, you know, the tourist industry. And that's where, you know, governments start to confuse the message. Uh, we should be focusing on the amazing companies that are here to change the world. Uh, 
uh, building amazing products, uh, making the lives of uh, the everyday person easier uh, or the corporates. So this should be the, the key message. And uh, I think with Malta specifically, uh, one key advantage for you guys is uh, the language because English is your, your you know, like a, a natural second uh, language. Uh, everyone speaks it. And uh, trust me, when, when you go to other countries like Spain, France, or Italy, this is not the case. So <laughs> you do have an advantage there. Very good point, very good point. So um, developing a little bit this further, let's stimulate a little bit the discussion. And I would be um, posing some suggestions. So I'm going to pose a list of suggestions. OK, I'm going to read them once. And then I will ask each and every one of you um, to either comment or else grade them um, uh, according to what you deem is best for the country, if you agree with me. And we'll follow the same order. So first I will ask Herman, then Lucas, then James, and they will end up with the meeting. So how would you rank these suggestions? Um, these are suggestions from what we gathered during the, uh, this conversation and even from uh, experiences on the island. So. As far as aggression permits, for example, Malta could adopt a leaner approach, even licensing ones. Um, we might need more coordination on a macro vision and a more balanced approach, even with regards to regulation. Ms. Herman might not like it, but it was specifically referring to virtual financial assets, particularly after we see Mika, which is a diluted version of our law. But we'll discuss this later on. More coordinated due diligence as well. That's becoming a, a very big teething problem. And the possibility of a centralized due diligence database to facilitate life even for fintech operators wanting to establish themselves in Malta. Provide as well more enablers to attract technological innovation because here we're speaking about fintech, so it can be solely redundant on technology, not necessarily on the service. So from this end, we've already touched on cross-sectorial sandboxes, which we were doing, working hubs, which were as well part of the original plan of the MFSA, of the MFSA, okay? And low cost as well, and flexible conditions, even with regards to leasing out premises and space. So even here, we might follow what others did and maybe improve it given our, the PICO dimension of our island. Now, specific grants as well for RecTech and FinTech ideas. So there, uh, I will cut specifically on what James mentioned, um, even certain initiatives to have more access to capital and investment and to attract angel investors as well, or investment locally, and more access to banking. Now, this is a very sore point. So more access to banking, can we adopt models which were tried um, uh, abroad to have more access to banking aside from the Open, open platform, uh, open banking initiative, which the MFSA uh, is leading. Uh, even supply to on, of human capital. I read you loud and clear, Dimitri. But do you think the university, academia, and our educational uh, system can cater for and create a better plan for a future generation of fintech expert, technology experts to tap specifically into this area? So these are the questions. And I will start by uh, asking Herman to comment, and then Lucas, James, and Dimitri may close the floor. Herman, you're on mute. Okay, how's that? Yeah, thanks for that, Ian. Um, not not an easy not an easy one, because um, because everything sounds sounds amazing. It's we just need to to push them about. Um, I, I have difficulty. I, I really liked what, what Dimitri was saying before, because I always thought that having an ecosystem is really, really important. So all these ideas of having uh, innovation hubs, getting the ecosystem going, getting uh, like-minded startups working together, because this will generate more enthusiasm and, and, and promote the, the fintech uh, sector in, in Malta. But to be honest, uh, what, what Dimitri mentioned that post COVID, maybe this is not so important anymore. Maybe, maybe we've used to now everyone working on his own, in his own, at, at his own place, maybe even different jurisdictions. So do we really need innovation hubs uh, anymore? 
uh, should we just focusing on on getting getting things going with within the regulator for example this in sandboxes and getting getting the the infrastructure going so i'm a bit i'm a bit uh, i haven't decided yet but i still think that that uh, having the innovation hubs having the access to capital having uh, grants because uh, uh, money is always a problem with startups so i think capital venture capitalists and angel investors um grants that's still important i would still i think um, move into having the these innovation hubs because i think having innovation hubs will will also stimulate our our youth specifically in, in malt as well to come up with 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 ideas to make them work towards in in in, in the sector um uh, cross sectorial sandboxes yes i i i hear that um we do have a sandbox, MDI has a sandbox, MGA has a sandbox. So I think we're a small jurisdiction. Maybe we should collaborate a bit more together so that we don't uh, duplicate efforts, skill sets uh, and resources are what they are. So I think we need to, to collaborate. Uh, um, access to human capital, you mentioned the, for sure. Um, we need to bring up our kids, our youths with, with this mindset of uh, entrepreneurship. I, I don't think we do enough yet. I think we're just exam focused and, and, and get, get that uh, good result, but we were not really into entrepreneurship uh, and, and then making it easier to, to do business for sure. So it's, it's faster, faster um, um, uh, company, VATS, tax uh, and banking. And and of course you mentioned you mentioned leaner leaner regulation, uh, for sure that would be nice. But but unfortunately this space is, is highly regulated as as you all know, and it's tightly regulated and there's very little um, space to 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 maneuver being a, regu a regulator in in within the European uh, scope sort of thing. So. So, so yes, uh, VFA was was easy because that was uh, homegrown. Uh, when Mika comes comes in, then there's very little to, there's let, very little maneuver to have. So, so yes, that that we should try to make it easier from a regulatory perspective. We should be more efficient, of course. We should uh, reach out and be available, but uh, making it proportionate as as much as we can for sure that would help. Um, that's that's where I am on this. Thanks. I'd like to hear Lucas' view on this, particularly from the technology point of view. Um, well, some, something that I could add on this sense is uh, the fact that um, I'm taking some elements already uh, uh, said by the other speakers, where uh, typically it, it's a good idea of attracting talents outside of Malta and bringing in Malta. But I believe that uh, before doing this, there really still needs to be uh, the fact of fostering talent within Malta itself. So that actually there's already some substance so that, you know, Malta can say there's already a minimum of things going on there. And then we can either attract some people or of course, even portray Malta uh, as, a, as a, even more of a tech hub because uh, even taking into account what's going on, what happened with COVID. So typically Malta, uh, I think regarding tourism has been greatly uh, impacted by this. So why not Malta go and focus into something that it can export another uh, domain, which here could be the service uh, place or like the tech space, um, more specifically speaking, and where Malta could be some sort of a tech hub in Europe. And that would of course beneficiate uh, in the finance industry until within the FinTech. Um, and that's why I think it's something where um, it's something to be developed. Uh, the fact that um, in relation to this, uh, a lot of things needs to be simplified because it's true in terms of administrative processes for companies to sell Malta, it's a little bit quite complicated, setting up some things, bank accounts, uh, VAT number and so forth. Uh, and so simplifying, you know, the onboarding of uh, tech companies from outside and also, of course, fostering from the inside is, uh, is, is quite essential and um, where actually Malta can even in some place um, be exporting its tech expertise at some point uh, to other uh, countries of the European Union. Um, and um, so that, that's, that's what I would think it's in, regarding some of the points uh, mentioned. Um, and in terms of, uh, of capital, well, it's still, I would say, 
some similarities in the fact of facilitating, you know, the attraction of also foreign capital, capital coming from other countries from the EU uh, in terms of, you know, maybe being able for themselves to set, maybe set up um, an office in Malta or something like that uh, in order to, to facilitate, um, you know, introductions uh, between the startups, the fintechs and, and um, the people uh, investing in, in startups. Um, and, um, and maybe a final point where the local um, organizations, why not the regulators and other um, organizations were to try to facilitate uh, programs to do a, may be a bridge basically between uh, the fintechs, so the startups, and actually uh, the bigger players of um, in, in the industry, where probably they'll be able to collaborate, do some prototypes with uh, with the bigger pl players. So, like for example, a bank, and then here they can validate uh, their products in the market, something like that. So that's I would believe would help a lot into um, establishing Malta as a, as a fintech Thanks. or tech hub. Yeah. Thanks, Lucas. Very valid point. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, James. What about you? What are your views? Well, ideally, we'll do them all, right? Uh, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a different approach. I think, um, I think we have to see it from what are the short-term things that we have to do, but essentially, where do you want to be? You know, a long-term, where do you want to be? And essentially, we all agree that long-term, we want to be, we want to position Malta where it is essentially, you know, a fintech hub, especially in, in, in Europe. And I think, in order for us to arrive there, I think we need to start looking at, you know, at the foundations. And the foundations are, you know, top of my list would be access to banking, quick access to banking, right? I mean, if companies are coming here, if you want to establish here, you need to have bank accounts very quickly. You need to establish your company very quickly, right? Because it's useless if you have, you know, a fund or funding, but you don't have actually the, the, these basics. So I think access to, to banking is actually really uh, on, top, on the list. The other thing is that, as Herman said, I mean, when, when you have regulation, right, you can't really be linear. It's regulation, it's there, you have to abide with it. But what can we actually do, right, to actually help us to stand out? What is in our control that we can actually do? And definitely, maybe we can look at, you know, doing, having a faster approach, for example, right? Across the board, you know, in, in process, not just, you know, with the regulator, but across, across the board. So that's, I think that would be, that would be um, also very important, also contribute to the, to the basics. And I think once, once then you have that, right, once you have the foundation of the banking, once you have a faster approach, okay, so it makes it start to make it more effective, more that. Then the next stage is technology, right? Because we're talking about FinTech, we're talking about technology. What are the elements? What are the building blocks? And definitely it's boxes, cross borders and boxes. These will all help to actually attract to, to come here because it makes it even more, you know, the, 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 this time to market makes it actually quicker, right? So that's actually becoming more and more attractive. And, and once you actually have that, then, and you actually now also get all these uh, companies, then the next thing is that, okay, that's where funding comes into place, right? So that's where, you know, we, we, we actually have, we need to have FinTech uh, grants. So this is more like probably like the, the, the medium to long-term things, right? So we get the basic side and the medium to that, the medium, medium to long is uh, funding, uh, focusing on FinTech. And that will also lead then to the creation of the ecosystem. That will also lead to creating accelerators focusing on, 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 on FinTech, right? Where you can actually then start to attract VCs, start to attract super angels, and also start to create innovation start to create innovation, which of course will, will grow the, 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 the human uh, capital side of things, right? That, that we need locally. So I would say, let's break them down, right? Let's, let's, what are the foundations? So the foundation would be quick access to banking, faster approach across the board. Uh, and then we're starting in the long term about, you know, having more uh, when it comes to funding and also human capital. Perfect. Now I know Dimitri, yours is the hardest task because everybody has practically given his comments. We've, let me maybe help you a little bit, even though you don't need. Um, and I'll take um, uh, one point from what James said. You mentioned innovation. We did not mention um, from, this, uh, from these questions, what if Malta looks a little bit 
on a wider ambit, being a technological um, center of excellence instead of fintech, since fintech is part of technology. And what about, uh, and Dimitri is well experienced that I think he can give us his insights here as well. He's already touched on this briefly before. And what about specifically on the service provision? You've been there, Dimitri, you've been with Revolut, now with, you're with the Ver Group. It's a, it's a pain, it's a very big pain. Um, uh, due diligence processes, multiple due diligence processes by different stakeholders. It costs money, it takes time. Uh, um, it requires human capital to monitor, to uh, take care of the regulatory process. What can be done? Can we try from the technological point of view as a technological center of excellence, think, think about something outside of the box, have a centralized model, something which, for example, India was thinking about. What are your views, Dimitri? Sure, so first of all, uh, Malta has amazing entrepreneurs right now. Uh, look, look, look no further than uh, James himself. He's uh, part of this uh, panel and he's uh, one of the uh, great examples of uh, entrepreneurs actually doing things, not just talking about it or having ideas. Um, and uh, he's now building a, a team that is expanding uh, not, not just in Malta, but in Europe. Uh, one way to do this is basically uh, work with um, advisors who have international experience. And I know that uh, James has teamed up with Spiros Margaris, um, a very, very experienced VC who is, who is based in uh, Switzerland. Uh, he, he's a uh, part of uh, two unicorns. He, he sit, sits on the board of two unicorns, fintech unicorns. And this is a way that uh, you can bring um, you know, experienced people in your teams and uh, help to connect the dots. So advisors are very important in this e equation, especially when you're starting up. You also have other entrepreneurs coming from the younger generation. And uh, maybe Herman knows this very well as well, because uh, he, uh, he has a, 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 an example from his own family, right? Uh, and, and who's doing amazing job. And um, maybe it's not fintech, but uh, he's promoting, you know, uh, entrepreneurship in uh, in students and in uh, campuses, and this is amazing. Why am I saying this? Because you you already have amazing examples, and you should uh, highlight them. You should talk more about it. Um, in Greece, for example, what what we have been uh, doing for the last ten years is trying to build this ecosystem and it doesn't happen overnight it takes uh, years to build and one of uh, the greatest way to do this um, is events basically uh, for example we started startup grind in Athens which is one of the largest um, network of uh, entrepreneurship uh, communities uh, ever in in the world it started from San Francisco we brought it in Athens in 2014 and every month we showcase an amazing entrepreneur who has built something. Guess who was our first speaker back in 2014? It was the founder of Viva that I told you about earlier, right? Seven years later, he is now a unicorn uh, founder. Uh, it was our first speaker. So I remember we tried to do this in, uh, in Malta as well, um, a startup grind in Malta. It didn't really pick up. I don't know why, maybe uh, people were not so interested in entrepreneurship, maybe you know uh, other things were in place, but I think this way of uh, building communities in a more interactive way, like actually meeting, um, learning new things um, by listening to uh, someone who is more experienced, learning from other people's mistakes so you don't do them yourself, asking for help, um, you know, you need funding, who should I talk to? Okay, there are always ways to, to find the funding. You keep hearing about uh, millions or even billions of dollars being um, invested in, in, in ideas everywhere. I don't think that uh, Malta should be holding an umbrella when the rain is uh, coming. Um, so I think, you know, accelerators and stuff like that is fine. But um, most times, uh, if you talk about fintech, they are driven by banks who just want to have a PR stand, right? It's more like, hey, we have an accelerator as well. We are pushing innovation and so on. If you look at uh, these accelerators, they have uh, very little results, if, if any at all. So 
the the best way to to do this is um, actually organizing the entrepreneurship uh, community uh, between you. It's it, it, don't don't wait for the government to help. Don't wait for you know universities uh, to be um, leading this. So when the buzz is there and you start to promote uh, like um, successful entrepreneurs and you have like amazing examples of uh, an exit, for example, somebody who, who got acquired for a $50 million or a $100 million or half a billion dollars. And it goes like that, step by step, it keeps growing. And then suddenly people around you, they are not uh, interested in uh, having a career anymore. They want to start their own business. So th th that's where uh, things are starting to, to evolve really fast. And maybe even the successful entrepreneurs who did an exit and have uh, and want to give back to the community, they start to become uh, angel investors as well. So again, don't look for um, these super angel investors to to come out of space. They will be themselves entrepreneurs who had an amazing um, success in the past, and they have an eye to understand and see. Uh, successful uh, or promising uh, startups to invest in. Um, this is my my kind of um, idea how to grow it. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's not an easy task. It takes years and years, but you have to start with somewhere. Well, it's, it's actually, it's fantastic. All the comments are noted. Um, it's, it's very interesting. We've seen diverse answers coming from uh, different um, baggages of experience, um, different ideas, but all in all, when you see everything into perspective, it's quite an encompassing position and uh, it sheds uh, value on more than there is prospect. Now, um, I will not ask you further questions because I think this has been to a certain extent quite exhaustive. Um, uh, however, I am looking at certain questions posed by uh, our participants. There are some which we've covered. There's a question on AI. I don't think it's the idyllic for us to speak about it. There's another one on um, uh, licensing. We've talked about this as well, and the importance of licensing and regulation. But there's a question which I believe is important and we did not touch upon. And I think uh, it's within your turf, Herman. Here we have a participant, okay. and we'll close with this one. We're bang on time. There's a participant which is asking, I, I believe that Malta and the MFSA is already embarking on similar projects, but you might want to elaborate further. What is being done um, with regards to agreements in tech or fintech area with countries like India and the UAE? Um, specifically, I think they we would capture those these these countries um, more within the the GFIN space because the, 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 the global uh, financial innovation uh, network, uh, that's, that's over 70 countries. Uh, I'm not sure whether India and UAE are there, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they are because they're very strong in, in the space. So we, we, although not reaching out specifically on bilaterals, uh, for sure we can get some, some um, experiences shared through to those networks. However, having said that, uh, we we have reached out or or we've been in, in bilaterals with with not specifically with UAE, but I, I believe with with Qatar and, and uh, areas like that, um, which obviously they, they are more excited by our proposal because we're the door we're we're at the door of, of Europe and they would like to access European uh, markets at uh, this this point was was mentioned again but but yes it could be it could be an idea to to reach out and, and explore such such markets thank Perfect. you for that uh, uh, i thank you gentlemen i thank all the participants um uh, i think we've exhausted our time bang on time perfect um we've been very diligent and disciplined um uh, i thank as well finance malta i urge all the members to support Finance Malta, um, to support this initiative because as the media correctly stated and as the other participant, we need to start discussing these things more. Industry perspective, or, um, uh, operators perspective, MFSA, and discussing them in the open because only through this collaborative effort, collaborative effort and bringing these things to the fore, 
can we develop and even further, um, further improve the product Malta? I leave you with this. Thanks a lot for everybody. Thanks a lot to everybody, and uh, we'll meet you again in our next seminar. Thanks. Bye.